Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 62 for you all. And I don't think we could be recording at a better time. I think every single major free agent domino has already fallen up until this point in time. We're thinking about potentially trying to record Friday, Saturday, right before everything really kicked off. We wouldn't have known where Paul George was going. We wouldn't know where Klay Thompson was going. I don't even know if the DeJounte Murray trade had happened at that point. So much has happened over just the first two to three days of free agency, not even just with free agent signings, also with trades. So we have a jam-packed, jam-packed show to get into to talk to, to, talk to y'all about all of these moves happening across the NBA and picking our winners and losers because I think there are some big, big winners so far in free agency. And definitely, definitely some major losers as well. Teams that are getting worse or just not getting better when all the teams around them are. So without further ado, how are we doing, Dame? How are we feeling? A couple of days into free agency. Your Lakers been uh been a little quiet. Been a little quiet. I, I saw a tweet that said they they've really gone 0 for 4 on all their, their big free agent targets. Haven't hit a single one yet. And apparently, Braun is just gonna take that max contract now. Man, I, I'm I'm doing good because I'm excited to record a podcast. As a Lakers fan, it's just more of the same of Lakers are interested in everybody and get nobody. <laughs> so I'm a little a little upset about that, man. But we'll get more into it. But overall, yeah, I feel like I'm excited. I'm ready to get into it. Definitely. It has been if you have Woj or Shams put a notifications on, which I'm sure a lot of y'all do as basketball fans, your phone has been blowing up all weekend. Since about when did it start? Midnight on Sunday or Saturday, whichever one. Um, mm-hmm. They could officially start negotiating those contracts. You know those contracts, been they've been working on those for weeks now, bro. Ain't, exactly. ain't no ain't no deadline stopping nothing. Everybody in cahoots these days. <clears throat> um, the way I really wanted, like, no super strict agenda with it, because all we got to do is go through every single major free agency decision. Some of them we're going to have a lot more to say, uh, including where I think we're going to start off, which I think was the biggest domino of free agency with Paul George. Some of them we're not going to have a ton to say. So if your favorite team don't get mentioned, we're not hating, bro. Uh, The last thing I do want to say before we dive right in to the Paul George signing, um, appreciate all y'all that uh, showed love on the Joel Dells interview that we did last episode. is I think our one of our most listened to episodes on Spotify and Apple Podcasts in I think like seven or eight months. Um, one of the most viewed podcasts we had on YouTube in a good little while as well. So appreciate all the support coming off of that episode as well. If you're new around here, like, comment, subscribe to the channel as always. Head over to the audio platforms, drop a five star rating, leave us a review. Follow us on the socials that you see there at the bottom of the screen at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. And at Off the Glass Pod on Instagram. Who has a mouthful? <laughs> Paul George is a Philadelphia 76er. He said, you know, he finally got to LA. He made all this talk about he's home. He want to bring a ring to the Clippers. You know, he don't he don't want to go anywhere. He wants to retire a Clipper. Okay. But he's with Embiid now. He's with Maxi now on a max deal now. Getting mm-hmm. 40, 50 plus million dollars a year when he's 38. That's right off the crazy. Crazy. Right off the bat, I'm gonna ask you. Oh, and I guess to piggyback off of this, they also did sign Tyrese Maxi to his max extension. Obviously, Philly had a ridiculous amount of cap space. They had to use it. Um, so they lock up Paul George and Tyrese Maxey to pair with Joel Embiid. Do you feel like this really moved the needle for the 76ers? Because I think at the end of this year, it felt like there was a clear gap in the top of the Eastern Conference where you had the Celtics, you know, and then probably a gap there. And then you get into a mix between if the Knicks are healthy, maybe Milwaukee if they're healthy. And then it kind of feels like Philly's even a gap below those teams. Do you feel like them – Adding Paul George, locking up Tyrese Maxey kind of puts them back into that conversation of being one of the best teams out East. Yes, 100%. 
replacing Paul George with Tobias Harris is instantly going to catapult you into a better, to being a better team. Um, I think Paul George fits there perfectly. Um, I think, honestly, it's like, I don't think they necessarily like 100% couldn't have won without adding another quote unquote star because the way Joel and B was playing before he got hurt last season, he was playing like the best player in the world. You know what I mean? Like he was playing like one of those guys that can play at that top tier level to win you a championship. It's just unfortunate. He ended up getting hurt. And even in the playoffs, he was, he was hurt. Um, and Maxi was a guy who looked like a solidified number two, who's only ascending, only getting better with a really good assortment of role players and a quality roster around them. So I already felt like, like me personally, I felt like if they didn't get hurt, like this could have been the year that they definitely got out of the second round. Like, Joel got at least that monkey off his back and was able to make some noise. Now, granted, Boston just looked like the juggernaut, so they probably would have won anyways. Um, but I felt like they at least was a team that was good enough to compete if they were fully healthy. So adding a guy like Paul George is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a perfect fit. You know what I mean? It's another guy who can create his own shot. It's another guy who can take pressure off those two guys. Um, it's another guy who, I mean, the defense hasn't been like elite, like how it used to be like earlier in his career, but it's a guy who isn't obviously still can play a little bit of defense there. Like, I just think the fit is perfect. Um, Paul George isn't going to ask to be the number one, of course. Um, there's going to be a nice way he might not even be the number two, especially if Maxi keeps ascending the way he's ascending. I think so, it's going to be most nights, to be honest with you. It's uh, honestly, I'm not opposed to it, especially like I said, especially if Maxi keeps because he got he's Maxi gets better every single year, you know what I mean? And he's a guy who isn't afraid of the moment come playoff time. Like you see them, you saw him win them games in the playoffs. You know what I mean? So yeah, I I just think it's a perfect fit. Um, I think in a Eastern conference where, I mean, we'll probably talk about it where the Knicks obviously got better. Um, The Celtics are as good as the Celtics are like it, it definitely puts you in that conversation um, to where just flat out talent wise, it isn't a huge, huge gap to where it's just like, ah, we really have no chance even when healthy. So I think it definitely puts them in that that 100%, you know, title contention, at least getting out of the East type of tier. I really do hate to be that guy. I do. Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> but we we all know, like, we can all call a spade a spade at this point. When Joel Embiid is healthy, like you said, he is in the conversation for the best player on the planet. When he's healthy, obviously his health has continually been a big issue throughout his entire career, especially come playoff time. Paul George is up there as probably (laughs) top three to four, at least in the last, you know, few years of his career at this point, especially when you look at just his Clippers tenure, fair or not, not somebody that you can count on being there in the playoffs whether that was a combination now of the injuries or just they they are calling him pandemic P bro. That's true. Like the issue for Philly has never been the, the talent there. It's about getting to the finish line. They can never get to the finish line in healthy enough to be able to cross it. Um, so look on paper, I, I love the fit. I think they're going to be a great team. It's right. I don't really don't like to be that guy, but it does have to come down to what is going, what is, what are y'all going to look like come mid April next year? They're all going to be healthy, ready enough to play through what's going to be a very physical top of the East. Because if the Celtics stay remotely healthy, if the Knicks stay remotely healthy, if the Bucks stay remotely healthy, you're going to have to see at least two of those teams if you want to get to the finals. But they're going to be dog fight series physical series so it it's tough for me to love it as much as i want to when i know that that is coming and i'd love to be proven wrong but it's so many years in a row where it's hard to go against the history that we have yeah i mean if we're talking about health 100 percent like like I said, Joel Embiid, the biggest problem for them has been health. Like Joel Embiid not being healthy when it matters. Paul George not being healthy when it matters. I completely agree from that standpoint. I'm just saying strictly basketball-wise, if they're on the court, which, again, could be seen as like the same way you look at the Clippers, where it's like 
oh, how how many times are you going to say if they're healthy, if they're healthy? Because they're just at some point, you know, what I mean, they're just not, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they are, I think the fact that, like you said, Maxi being there to where Paul George isn't relied upon as much as he was on the Clippers to where obviously at the times that Kawhi isn't there, Paul George is your number one, which he, he admitted himself he's not a, a number one. You can see he's not a number one. Um, even times where there's times where he can't step up as a number two, not saying he can't do it all the time, but there's times where he's relied upon to be a, a, a trusted number two and he couldn't come through. Like I said, Maxi, I trust Maxi in the playoffs. Um, I trust Maxi as far as his ascension, him being that guy who could step up and be a number two. So just as far as him plugging in there and giving you that star level, like type performances occasionally, but not relied upon to be the guy, I think that if they're healthy. It's definitely a really good fit for him. Like, like I said, I completely agree though. If it's in terms of like this is strictly on paper to me. Like, as far as like would I pick them to come out of the East? No, because one, I still don't think that they're better than the Celtics. I still think I like the the Knicks a lot as well. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't, that Knicks fit is just we can oh, we're gonna talk about it. I, I am too. We're gonna talk about it, but I think I like the Knicks uh, uh, better than them as well. But mm-hmm. as far as like on paper being in that tier, I think that puts them up there. Also, because like I said, jo- the way Joel and me was playing, he was literally playing like he was the best player in the planet. Yeah. So if you pair Maxi with that, if you pair Paul George with that, I think on at least on paper, it's definitely a team that should be in, at least in that tier. Um, but we talk about it all the time. The games aren't played on paper. <laughs> so when it comes yeah. down to it, if we're talking about health wise, yeah, I'm definitely not betting on this team whatsoever. But just as far as the fit, if all guys are there, I think that this is a really good team who can be in that tier. It just comes down to them being healthy and then putting it all together. Because, I mean, you talk about injuries all you want with Joel Embiid. He also is a guy who hasn't really shown up in the playoffs as well to play to that MVP level standard that he has in the regular season. So I think to me, this is a team that is going to come down to it's just going to come down to the playoffs. Like. I mean, obviously, it's going to kind of matter a little bit what they do in the regular season, but in reality, it's not in the same way. It's like you guys can have a fantastic regular season. I need to see you guys put it together in the playoffs before I mm-hmm. ever really give you guys that full credit. But strictly on paper, if healthy, I do think it at least puts them in that tier to where it's not like a huge gap. Um, but I still had the Celtics and I had the Knicks ahead of them for sure. I, I think I would agree with putting those two teams in front of the 76ers as well. Um, and let me be very clear. Like, I know it probably sounded like I was hating to start off how I felt about the Paul <laughs> George fit. I, like you said, it is 1,000% an upgrade. They just replaced Tobias Harris, who gave them literally zero points in a winner go home game with Paul George. Like, it is a massive, massive upgrade. Like we've been saying, the fit on paper makes so much sense. Um, and he, you're going to have – more rim protection at the rim with Joel there. Paul Jordan, I don't think, is going to be relied upon to be as big of a defender um, as he has been in the past because I just think Father the time catches up to you, he's not the defender that he used to be. And we've both been talking about it. Now he gets the luxury of being the third option. And Paul George as a third option, it's hard to find better talented third options out there um, right. than a guy like PG. So. 1,000% on paper and health permitting. I think they can take anybody um, to the limit and, and have the, you know, what it takes to be able to get to the finals and potentially be a championship caliber team. Um, it's just going to take getting there and being healthy uh, when the time matters for that to, to happen. But re- yeah. re- I was going to say, regardless of that, uh, they also bring in Andre Drummond on a two-year deal. Um, which I think is one of the more underrated moves of the free agency window. He's quietly been playing very good basketball. He's just been playing for the Bulls, so people didn't care. (laughs) Um, They bring in Eric Gordon on a two-year deal, and then Kelly Oubre also comes back. So, again, spacing, shooting, defense, rebounding. You've got a backup big for Joel. Uh, I like everything that they've been putting together um, so far in free agency on top of the fact they drafted TikTok boy, little Jeremy McCain. <laughs> already got he about three, four TikTok dances <laughs> in, a, he, in a Sixers uniform already. He pushing them out, man. He pushing he, the content out. I tell you one thing, the Sixers social media team was probably ecstatic that they drafted him. <laughs> They're like, oh, my God, he going to make our life so easy. All you got to do is repost it. He's he giving you content for the free. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw somebody tweet. They said, 
uh, they, they've seen more Jared McCain TikToks than they have buckets made. Is he a good player or not? <laughs> <laughs> That is, uh, yeah, I feel you. If you haven't watched, like, if you have never seen him before, like, you definitely just like, bro, does this guy just make TikToks? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's funny. Um, but again, I even think he's a guy who could come in and contribute, not necessarily at a super high level for them early on, but again, just a guy who can come in and you know provide a scoring punch, can handle the ball a little bit, has some self creation as well, um, which is always going to be a welcome addition for a championship team, championship level team, especially coming off your bench. So. Really, really love everything they've done so far this offseason. I think despite how it came off at first with the Paul George signing, I'd say they're definitely a winner of this free agency period. And if you want to lump in the draft as well, I like the Jeremy McCain selection there too. Yeah, 100%. I, yeah, I think they're a big winner. Like I said, it puts them in that tier. It's just going to come down to can they actually – can they actually do it? Can they actually get it done? But it, they, they don't have – there's no excuse, like, whatsoever. There's no, like, yeah. oh, the Celtics are too stacked. Just, no. Hey, you have enough to get it done. It's just a matter of actually going out there and doing it. But, yeah, huge winners in free agency for sure. Another team that I think is a huge winner with one of, honestly, probably the – I wouldn't say the most shocking trade, also in the sense that, it kind of you feel like it was brewing a little bit. They talked, you know, tweeting at each other. Obviously, they all are from uh went to Villanova. They're Nova all friends, Knicks, man. Nova Knicks. Right. Um, but just so you finally saw the notification go through, bow, the Knicks are trading for Mikel Bridges, and they gave up what was it, four first round picks, mm-hmm. pick swaps, so almost essentially five first round picks for Mikel. And then a couple of days later. Lock in OG on a long term deal, man. It's a Knicks tape. It's a Knicks tape. They are Bro. big, big winners. One of the biggest winners, arguably the biggest winner, um, to some people of free agency. Even though their biggest move obviously came via trade, but like you mentioned earlier, the fit is so good. What about Mikel Bridges playing for the New York Knicks? Do you like so well? I like the fact that you telling me I got Mikel Bridges over here. I got OG over here. And mm-hmm. de- like, bro, the defense is going to be crazy. I think that to me, with this trade, right? Obviously, the fact that the chemistry is going to be on point, even for go- like guys that don't haven't played together in the NBA. <laughs> right. <laughs> the fact that obviously these guys are all friends. You see what it did for Josh Hart, DiVincenzo, these type of guys. Like, they're just going to be so locked in together i think the fit is so perfect as a guy who can obviously you see what mikhail can do uh, when he has some opportunities offensively but the fact that he's going to be played more similar to how he did in phoenix to where he doesn't have to be the, he's definitely not the guy he's not even the number two over there so he can kind of fall back and probably take more of a step up in the defensive side of the ball like how he was in phoenix um, I think that fit is perfect in there. I know Tibbs love it because this guy don't miss games, so he's gonna nope. be playing <laughs> 40 minutes a night locked in. Um, so but I also all just I do think he fits that defensive culture he has over there, so that's absolutely perfect for him. Um, I, I just think they're gonna be a really good overall team, man. Like, it's not like like you look at the Mo- Mikel Bridges trade, it's like they're not trading for a superstar, they're not trading for Kevin Durant or nothing like that, but I think that he this trade fits with the culture over there it fits with the team and it fits with the way they want to play um to the point where like to me it's a no-brainer like it is a home run trade to Mm -hmm. me like i think that this trade even if because i i think the celtics are more talented for sure but the knicks can be are well not can be are built in a way to where they can play them as best as anybody. It's kind of like, you know right. how, like, Minnesota, right, with the Nuggets. Yep. It's like Rudy Gobert, Cat. Like, oh, you got two bigs. You're built to beat the Nuggets team. Like, this Knicks team can be built to beat the Celtics when you have a guy like Mikel and OG to where, obviously, they're not the same offensive players as Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. But defensively, especially with Mikel, like I said, not, being, not having to take on much of that scoring load, they can sit in that chair and really lock down and, like, give those guys as big of a problem as probably anyone in the league with this team, along with the defensive scheme and everything. Obviously, you still have a, a Jalen Brunson doing his thing. Julius Randle's going to come back. I, it's perfect to me. And then I think also another big thing, too, is where 
it gives them so much depth to where like a guy like Josh Hart and DiVincenzo who are to an extent kind of playing above their uh, their talent level a little bit. Like, not oh, to an extent. Yeah. <laughs> DiVincenzo I mean, yeah, was going ballistic some games, bro. I mean, that's the power of friendship, man. That's the, yeah. that's the power of just liking your team, liking your guys. But, no, nah, I agree. He, he definitely was playing over his – over his uh over skis a little bit, I guess that's the term to say. But this actually – His what? That I, I think that's the term. Over his skis, is that the right term? Something like that. I don't know. I've heard that before. I could be wrong. I wow, swear that's okay. – I've heard that before. I I'll look heard it up that one. There. I swear – I'll look it up I before. I mean, that it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I think um this is good at the fact that they're not just like banking on the fact that Josh Hart is gonna play that great, Devin Chandler is gonna play that great to where they're gonna add um a guy like Mikael Bridges to where now that gives them even more depth with those guys being able to come off the bench. Um you still got Deuce McBride. You like you still it's a really deep team. So to me, absolutely A plus, like no brainer, because I mean most people not most people, I mean Real, if you look at it and you're not really thinking of how the fit and everything was going to work, you might look at it and be like, oh, you traded four, what is it, five first round picks from Mikael Bridges. But reality, you, you got a window. You know what I mean? Your team is relatively not, I mean, I mean, I guess it's relatively young. It's like middle of the pack. It's not like, it's not an old team. It's not like a super young team. I think your window is now, basically. And I think mm-hmm. you seize your opportunity. So I love the trade 100%. You said it right there. Your window is now. If it sounds like overpay, if it is overpay, it doesn't matter. You go and get your guy because if y'all win a championship, nobody is going to care how many first-round picks you gave up to get Mikael Bridges if you're holding the Larry O'Brien trophy. That's all that matters at the end of the day. So, uh, yes, the Brooklyn Nets got an absolute haul, um, and I think now this gets every asset from the Kevin Durant, tra- Kevin Durant trade officially settled with them. I think it ended up with nine first round picks um, in total from essentially trading Kevin Durant for Mikael Bridges and then trading Mikael Bridges for even more first round picks. Um, so good on Brooklyn that they finally have made that decision to get out of teetering that no man's land going into full rebuild. Um, additionally, going and getting some of their picks back. Uh, picks back from Houston as well um, in some trades um, looking to try to set themselves up to be at the top of this next year's draft, which is supposedly supposed to be really, really nice. Obviously the guy like guys like Cooper flag um, projected to be coming out towards the top of the lottery next year. Um, where do you think OG and Mikel ranks among the best defensive duos in the league? Like off the top of my head, I think about like, Obviously, Drew Holiday, Drew and Derek White, Derek White. Mm-hmm. right? You got like Jaden Jimmy McDaniels, and Ann, right? Jaden and, and Rudy, or Jaden and Ant, whatever way you want to take. That. If you say duels like wing duels or just like defensive duels, I would just general. say defensive duels. Wing duels, I feel like, man, <laughs> this might be the one. To be honest, it, like it might be. Like I said, like Mikel when he doesn't have to be because he was like the guy in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like so, like obviously anybody. It's, it's only a few players who can really be your number one option and also be an elite defender, like, like taking on that type of task. Um, so, like, him not having to do that in an offensive end, like, he, he'll probably – nine times then he'll go back to being that elite-level defender that he was, like, in Phoenix. So, man, I mean, like I said, wing defenders, that could be – it legitimately could be could one. Could be them. Uh, just overall duos, even that is, like – it's top three, I think. Like, it's off the t- no one, if no one jumps to my head, just like off the top of my head, like I, I think they're at least probably three. Like, that, that's an insane, <laughs> that's an insane like defensive duel right there. It's ridiculous. I mean, depending on the Mitchell Robinson situation, it looks like he might be gone. But now they lost Hardenstein. I don't know. Maybe they offer him a bigger deal. Whatever the case may be, if he's there, you have him on the back end. Josh Hart is no flowers. You know, all these guys are going to play very, very aggressive, mm-hmm. give high uh, levels of effort on the defensive side of the ball, the Tibbs coach team. Snick's team is as much fun as they were to watch this past postseason. They are, like, somehow getting even more like what you would expect this Knicks team to be like. I don't know how they got more Knicks than this past year. They did, yeah. But 
this team, this Knicks team is more Knicks than we've seen in a very, very long time. Yeah. Uh, super excited for them. They I are definitely say, one of the biggest winners uh, of this free agency period. I will say I agree. So I think it's also like an A-plus trade for the Brooklyn Nets as well to get out of no man's land and getting your mm-hmm. pick back, which is a huge thing, right. instead of tanking when you tanking when you don't have your pick makes no sense because you don't even reap the benefits of tanking right. <laughs> so getting your your pick back is it's crucial but yeah. yeah getting four first for mikhail bridges who like realistically when you think about it too when a lot of players be like yo i want to go to this team you're getting a like you're not getting the most value because mm-hmm. everyone knows he wants to go to this team so still getting for four first round picks is absolutely huge um, and then obviously having a full on direction, especially like you said, in a deeper draft com- or a good draft coming up, I think it's an A plus trade for the Brooklyn Nets as well. Yeah, I think it's one. it's it's a very rare, I think, A trade on both sides. Like, right, both everybody involved is getting exactly what they need at this moment in time. Um, mm-hmm. and that's going into their rebuild, and the Knicks looking to get that one piece that can get them over the top to potentially make a finals and or championship push. Um, So definitely love that for New York. They did, however, lose Isaiah Harnstein to who I think you could really make an argument to be potentially the biggest winner as well of the agency so far. (laughs) Somehow, some way, the one seed in the stacked, loaded bloodbath that was the Western Conference this past year has found a way to not just get better, but get significantly better. The Oklahoma City Thunder trade Alex Caruso, or trade for Alex Caruso by giving up Josh Giddy and nothing else, a straight-up player-for-player trade. Where do we even do that at? They don't do that in the NBA or the NFL. I didn't, I didn't know that was a thing no more. I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> I didn't, you, don't like, even, you don't even you don't throw seconds attached? Veto. What? Fleece on, right <laughs> on top of all of that, you get no picks back from the team that got the most picks, bro. It's like, oh, it, it just good GMs take advantage of poorly run organizations. <laughs> That's what happened. You telling me if you in any sort of rebuild whatsoever, you don't get picks back, like I said, from the team that has a bajillion picks, bro. Mm-hmm. Like. Bro, Zero. O- bro, OKC just was the one seed and just added Alex Caruso and Isaiah mm-hmm. Hardenstein for Josh Gideon some money. They didn't give up a, like, if I don't know if you want to call Giddy a key rotational player because in the playoffs he basically was unplayable. No, he was unplayable. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, like, he wasn't, like, a, a key cog in this. Right. Or any picks. Like, they just got significantly better. And they didn't even have to give up any of their – they still have room to, to do more. more. Right. Like, I, bro, I don't know, man. It's I Like I said, I think that they won free agency because of the way – how significantly they upgraded versus how little they really gave up is like they, – they, I think they won the offseason, bro. Yep. I think they had to. Like – and like I said, good GMs take advantage of, of poorly run organizations because there's no world where Alex Caruso should go for Josh Kitty. I don't care how high you are in Josh Kitty. That's just not that value don't even make sense. Teams were talking about throwing two or three first for Caruso this year. It's nothing changed about his play. Bro, the, the like the Bulls are so it's like it's like they purposely wait for the worst time to trade guys. It's just like they're like, your value is the highest now? Nah, that's when we should keep you to go for the play-in. Oh, your value a little bit lower? And this is probably the worst. You know what's the crazy part about it is? His value probably wasn't even lower. It's like, you st- if you shopped around Alex Caruso, you just was like, yo, he's on the trade block. Right. You still would have got more than Josh Giddy. Like, so it's not even like his value went down. It's just like, you just took the the bad deal for no reason. I don't know. I don't know what they do over there. It, it just don't make sense to me. Look, I, I think Josh Giddy still can be a good NBA player. I think he needs a shot doctor to come in and really <laughs> try to get him back comfortable shooting. There's question marks coming in when he was drafted that the you know perimeter shooting would be a struggle for him. 
It's been real up and down. Obviously, his last season was a really, really down, especially in the postseason to the point, like we said, he was unplayable for the Thunder in that series against Dallas. But there's still a lot of upside there. He's still super young. I understand that logic of it, and maybe that's just me really trying to wrap my head around the Chicago side of things because other than that, bro, I, Caruso was a guy that you had. There's just no – if you would have told me there was, they didn't get any picks back, I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me they didn't get any first-round picks back, I wouldn't have believed you. To just get Josh Giddy for Alex Caruso – really seems like it should be vetoable. If this was fantasy football, all the other GMs would be lining up to veto that trade. No way they're letting Oklahoma City get Caruso. It was one of those trades where it's like everybody else looking at it like, I didn't even know you was trading him. It's like, right. like I didn't know he was available. You know what I mean? It was like one of them type trades. But I remember I seen something where it was like the Bulls ownership was like, the only thing that matters is – um like your fans knowing at the end of the year that you still have a chance, even if you like can't win this, can't win at all. What Chicago fan has thought they had a chance the last four or five years, bro? They it mean like not even like to win the championship. It means like it's like it's basically their way of saying instead of tanking, like we want to give our fans just a slither of hope. Oh no, 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 it was like the end of the season, the fans always want something to play for. Like, instead of, like, you know how when you rebuild and tank, like, obviously you're not playing for – you're playing to lose on purpose versus, like, the, the reason why the Bulls keep trying to go for the play-in or something like that. They try to make their games matter towards the end of the season. When it's like, bro, like, you're prioritizing that over actually building a team that can legitimately do something. Like, right. it, bro, all I know is MJ saved the Bulls from being, like, the Doesn't bottom get talked of the about bottom. Enough. Bro, he saved them – before him, nothing. After him, D Rose and nothing. Nothing like, else. He, like he saved them from being like the bottom of the barrel as far as franchises go. They bro. would be one of the most poverty organizations, bro. Because again, when Jordan came in, and I'm sure this happened across the league, but it gets more talked about with with Jordan and time with the Bulls. You talk about players in the locker room drinking, smoking. Doing that, you dig, yeah. you know, little little booger sugar in the corner, <laughs> like, bro, and was going out and losing a bunch uh, all day, all season. It's just, bro, I don't know, man. It's, oh, it's oh. crazy. Um, w- this was supposed to be about OKC, okay, but since we <laughs> look, the the Bulls, one hundred percent. One of the biggest losers of free agency, one of the biggest losers of last season, the season prior, the season prior to free agency, the season prior trade in line. One of the, biggest the Bulls has been life. taking L's, yeah. bro. This is a Lose. losing organization at this point. They're poverty, bro. The definition of poverty. The fact that they brought in new front office people and guys like Carney Chauvis after the Gar Packs era, where so many fans literally have fire Gar Packs t shirts, couldn't stand that front office. And it, I actually think it's worse, bro. I actually think they're making worse moves than they did before. How's that even possible, bro? I don't know. I genuinely think you could take any NBA YouTuber, podcast, or whatever, and just put them in a GMC right now for the Bulls, and they're in, they're they're at least can't be worse. They cannot be worse, bro. Bro, it's like they're making moves to where like any literally anybody with a uh, any sort of brain is like what? Like anybody is like, come on, what, what are we doing? Like it's just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I just, I could. All I know is my heart goes out to Bulls fans. It really does, 100%. especially Bulls fans who didn't live to see the MJ. Like, like oh my fans, gosh, yeah. Older Bulls fans is like, I ain't gonna lie, y'all sold y'all sold <laughs> for, for two, three peats. Two, three peats, yeah. But if I'm a Bulls fan that didn't even get to really enjoy that, favorite player growing up was D Rose. You only know heartbreaking pain, bro. That's all you know. That's all you know, bro. And it just keeps going, keeps going. Whew. Yeah, I feel for them. Um, to to wrap up what we were saying about the Thunder, though, um. I would say coming out of this past season, two of their biggest needs that they needed to address was perimeter shooting because obviously 
and not just Giddy. Like, as a team, they shot significantly worse from the three, and that series against Dallas was a big reason why they lost. Mm -hmm. But Giddy obviously did not help <laughs> the situation hmm. um, because he was such a negative on defense, and they were just – daring him to take any perimeter shot from the corner, from the wing, anywhere on the court. They just were going to let him shoot threes up. He was bricking the vast majority of them. So they go in and get Caruso, who's a better defender and a better catch-and-shoot shooter than Josh Giddy. Both of those things he does significantly better than Josh Giddy did. Fits so well perfectly into this starting lineup for the Thunder. And then – they also needed some more size on the inside, potentially needed a backup big or a big that you could maybe even play with Chet. And I think outside of getting a legitimate stretch five, they got the next best thing in a guy like Hartenstein, who is not a super down low, hardcore bruiser, can be a screen setter, can be a decision maker with the ball. He is a good finisher around the rim and then also very good on the defensive side of the ball. Got some all defensive team consideration this past year as well. Um, I think they can play either one of them interchangeably at the five and they can play them both together on the court for a bit. Obviously that, you know, messes with the five out stuff that they did for a good portion of this year. But I think some of the positives that you can get by playing them to again, not for long periods of time, but spurts throughout the game could outweigh the, the negatives of the, you know, spacing on the offensive side of the ball. Um, so I, I think they, they filled, two of their biggest needs very efficiently, very quickly and early on into free agency. Like you said, they might not be done, man. They genuinely might not be done. Whenever you have as many picks as they do, they could always put a godfather offer in front of any team. So they could at any given time shake the league up even more. So definitely one of the biggest winners um, of free agency so far, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Yeah, one hundred percent. I love the Hardenstein pickup. So like I said, I think um I like I also I think they can play together him and Chet. Um, and I think that it helps them. I I think what you said when it says like the positive outweigh the negatives, basically of not being able to play the five out when they do that, is like very very true. Like I think being bigger on the inside, mm -hmm. um, when that was one of their big weaknesses, is definitely going to help them more than hurt them as far as like not being able to always do that five out type of play style. But I also think they kind of they have the personnel to switch it up a little bit. Um, so I think, like I said, I think they're the biggest winners because I think that they addressed, like I said, <laughs> their problems was like they were a little bit small in the interior. They solved that. And then Josh Giddy replacing Josh Giddy with Alex Caruso. Like they just, they filled their weaknesses for n not nothing, nothing, but like, a they, guy they, that what they was not playing they, in their playoff games, and what made it worse was like I think uh, Josh Kitty like requested a trade, so like a guy that yeah. you move anyway. It's like you traded your scraps for gold, yeah, and didn't give up none of your picks. Like huge winners, absolutely huge winners this offseason. Legitimate, like, like man, it's okay. He's gonna be scary, bro. Okay, he's good. they already were good last year. Um, but to fill those weaknesses like that, they're going to be really, really good. They are going to along be. with along with guys ascending too. J Dub Chet was a rookie, like right. They're they're legit, bro. Yep, and then they also. I don't know why I'm forgetting the draft already. They got Topich, right? Am I tripping? Yeah. Which is if I know that you're not super big into you know, scouting, and he'd even play in NCAA, played overseas. Uh, but they drafted Nikola Topic, who coming into the draft was a guy that had consideration to be, you know, a high, high pick, talking like top five, top three. Early on in the process, I've seen people potentially mock him as the number one best player in the draft. I've seen that he, a while ago, like a long, a long time ago. Yeah, he tore, I think his ACL – um, playing overseas, and that obviously hit a ding to his draft stop. But the upside is ridiculous. He's like six, 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 seven, Serbian guard, like super high IQ, super crafty, can dribble. Like the the Thunder continue to just be in such a crazy position with their rebuild, where they can just take these draft picks and just go for the most highest ceiling guys possible 
And like, you know, they took Usman Jang a couple years ago. They took Poku a couple years ago. It's like guys who, if they don't pan out, are you super, super shocked? Mm, not really. But if they do, and you get to pair right. that with J-Dub and Chet and Shea, you're really stacking the deck. So I just love the aggressiveness um, that Sam Presti continues to put uh, forth with his roster construction. I don't think there's even a debate at this point that he's far and away the best GM um, in basketball. I think Brad Stevens did a phenomenal job with the Celtics, but what Presti has done for years now with OKC, and I think he is the king of polices. <laughs> like he's real. just out here <laughs> robbing these other GMs in broad daylight. I'm not even Man picking up the phone if I'm a GM. You got to block his number. I'm, I'm good, bro. <laughs> like, you ain't about to get me. I'm right. straight. You ain't about to get me. But nah, man, I agree. They they uh, they playing with house money, man. And I'm all for drafting another Nicola. <laughs> um, I'm all for that. Definitely. So. Um, let's round through a couple more here that I want to go through really quickly. Um, unfortunately, they only have them set up by team, so I can't just go by, like, the biggest one. So. Just gonna rattle off some of the low hanging fruit here. I wouldn't say the Celtics. Actually, I, no, I, I'll, I'll take it back. The Celtics, I would say, are a winner just by the fact that they were able to bring all their guys back. They bring Luke Cornett back. Derek White comes on a four year extension, and then obviously Jason Tatum gets his max. I think it was three hundred and fourteen million. Three fifteen. Um, I don't know, one or two, same thing. Yeah, yeah, $315 million, five-year super max extension. Largest contract in NBA history. Uh, Drew's under contract. Jalen already got his contract. Chris Lapp's got his contract. Everybody, everybody's on the books. Mm -hmm. They are locked in, ready to run it back for next year. So just, just off the strength of bringing their guys back, they got to be a winner. 100%. 100%. You had to do. You had to pay all those guys. So that's what happens when you want to chip, too. People get paid. Right. Um, Charlotte Hornets also kind of quietly made some solid moves. Uh, they get Reggie Jackson for a couple of second round draft picks. Um, so bringing a veteran presence there, uh, in their guard room. And they also got Josh Green as a part of a larger sign and trade that sent Clay Thompson to the Dallas Mavericks. Did you what do you what do you feel when you saw the jersey swap of him in a Mavericks uniform? You know, like that era in Golden State is like it's been rumored for a couple seasons now. We've talked about it a bunch, but it's actually over. Once I seen him in the jersey, and once I seen it, it was official, it was like, dang, like wow, like the Warriors era is really over. Like it's over for like it's just as far as Clay, Steph, Draymond, like that's over. Because even when they said, like, yeah, he's a little disgruntled, yeah, he might not be coming back. E even when they said, Yeah, he's they're negotiating like a sign and trade, like he's definitely not coming back. Even then, I was just like, eh, like it, it just didn't hit until like you know, you seen it, you actually see him in the jersey. It's probably gonna hit even more so when you actually see like the season starts and he's playing for another team you know what i mean but it's wild man it's wild like that that era is really over but i mean i can't really blame the warriors um and i can't i, I guess you can't really blame clay like he's he felt disrespected by their offer um they just couldn't come to terms but man, it, it is a little bit weird though seeing him in a, in a mavericks uniform I, I don't think I've seen people who be like, yeah, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be like a Celtic Shack type of vibe. I'm not gonna lie. If if we talk about a Celtic Shack or like somebody going on that Celtics path, I'm more so lean with the other guy that left the Warriors, which was Chris Paul. Oh he's been, yeah, he's been in a bunch of uniforms, so I wouldn't necessarily say that because Clay was a guy who played for the Warriors his whole career, and this is his first time going to a different team. It's just more so weird. Um, but yeah, it's. End of an era. End of an era. End of an era for sure. Um, I'm looking right now on our TikTok to find the video. Here it is. That we posted. This was after they traded Jordan Poole for Chris Paul. I said 
then this is we this was june 2023 so almost actually just over a year ago said it didn't make sense then he just killed his two hole you know double timeline stuff you have one timeline it's steph you have got to focus on just trying to maximize this window they didn't they kicked the can another year they got older they tried to retool they brought in chris paul it did not work they don't even make the playoffs and now their team is i would say even worse off now um having missed out on the paul george sweepstakes because they actually were saying like they threw a pretty large offer in front of the clippers and the clippers said nah we're not trading you to the warriors they would rather let paul george walk for free and trade him to the golden state warriors for it sounded like a package that was going to include, I think, Kaminga and Moody and some picks. Crazy. Um, is what had been rumored. I, well, we're taking that in a heartbeat. But Crazy. Here we are. And uh, I got the comments pulled up because I was told, top comments says, bro, just proved how he doesn't know ball. I don't know. Seems like seems like I knew what I was talking about before. Or the Warriors knew what was going on there. This video makes me glad that not everyone has a big, big platform. Guy's also wrong, too. It's called extending a championship window. If Golden State wins the championship <laughs> over the next two years, none of this matters. You responded to it, said they aren't winning a championship. They certainly did not. <laughs> no, they did not. <laughs> like, bro. I don't know how it took so long for people to see the writing on the wall here. This team was not the team of old. Clay was not the clay of old. And that is okay. It's going to be very, very weird to see him in a Dallas Mavericks jersey. I actually like the fit a lot. As much as we've, I think, gotten on clay, and I think some of it is definitely deserved. Most or all of it is deserved. Um at the end of the day, he still is one of the most elite catch and shoot players in the NBA right now. Forget all time, just Clay today. Still one of the best catch and shoot players. You're putting a guy with that type of lethal shooting on the court with the same time as Luka Doncic, who's going to bring so much gravity on the same time on the court with Kyrie Irving, who's also going to be bringing so much gravity. Offensively, it's like chef's kiss with the spacing right now. I do have some questions defensively, partially because they lose Derrick Jones Jr. to the Clippers, um, and they don't really have a point-of-attack guy. And I'm going to say this now. It feels like they went out and they got Kyrie, and it was this, oh, my gosh, we're just going to outscore people, and they don't make the plan. In the following season, they retool their defense. They go out and get Grant Williams. That doesn't work. That turns into P.J. Washington, though. They bring in Derrick Jones Jr. They draft Derrick Lively. They trade for Daniel Gafford. They make defense their identity, and they make the NBA Finals. It now feels like they're tearing down the defense a little bit to try to buff up the offense, which is a very fine line to walk is all I'm going to say because I do think their defense is not why they lost the Finals. I think they definitely struggled shooting um, and just did not have enough enough playmakers on the offensive side of the ball. So much, so much came down to Luka and Kyrie, which is what we had talked about. So I understand that. But again, the defense can get very bad very fast without any point of attack guy. You're just going to be leaving guys like Lively and Gafford to fend for themselves at the rim, which we saw Rudy Gobert is one of the best rim protectors of all time, struggle mightily in Utah when they put no defenders around him. No amount of rim protection can make up for no perimeter defense. So – Interested to see how they continue to build out this offseason, but I do ultimately like the fit with Clay um, in Dallas. I think when this team gets hot and on a run, it's going to be ridiculous, bro. The shots yeah. that are good. Like, can you imagine Kyrie comes down, crazy floater finish, Luka comes down, step back three, somebody gets a steal, fast break, Clay just sprint to that corner. And you know that's cash every single time. Crowd is going to be electric. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's also going to be crazy to see, like, Steph and Clay are going to play each other this year. <laughs> it's going to be a three-point shooting contest. 
that thought actually just crossed my mind for the first time. Like I hadn't even thought of it from that perspective, but yeah, they're going to have, they're probably going to extend to the game. They're going to guard each other. That's going to be, it's just so crazy. If you would have told me two, three years ago that Clay Thompson would not have been retiring a Golden State Warrior, I'd have been like, you're, you're lying. What timeline am I in, bro? There's no mm-hmm. way. And they done broke the core up. Yeah, man, it's crazy. Uh, I, I like the fit as well offensively. Um, I think that what you said about them thinking, I mean, because obviously they seen that really they couldn't shoot the ball that well in the finals. Um, the defense wasn't the, wasn't the biggest problem, I'd say. I think that's part of the reason why they went out and got a guy like Clay Thompson. So I think that offensively, like I said, especially when it's going well, yeah, it's going to look amazing. Um, but I do worry a little bit on the defensive side of the ball. Um, losing a guy like Derek Jones Jr., I, I think that it is going to be a little worrisome um, on defense. But, hey, I mean, I, I'm interested at least to see how it works because I do think, like you said, when it does, when it is going well, it's going to be very, very fun at the very least. Um, so, I mean, I'm interested. I, like I said, I like to fit offensively. I'm curious to see how it works. Um, apparently, it was him. Or it was the Mavs of the Lakers. Um, I, I would have been fine with Clay coming. Um, Clay would have fit super well with, with Los Angeles Lakers, too. It would have been a perfect fit. I, I, I'm i not going to lie. I thought we had it in the bag. I'm keeping a bug with you. But, hey, that's how it is when you're a Lakers fan. You're yeah. and Lakers are interested in everybody. Lakers are interested in everybody. They are. I'm um, interested in the Lamborghini. But <laughs> that don't mean I'm getting a Lamborghini. So, I don't know. It is what it is. But, yeah, I, I like to fit with the Mavs. I'm curious to see how it works out this year. Yep, he signs a three-year, $50 million deal with a player option, um, which is obviously, what is that, like 23-ish million dollars. Am I tripping my math off? Three, what did you say? It was three, what? <laughs> I don't know why it's, it's bad. Yeah, it's 16, years, 16 million a year, give or take. Mm. Um, but, which I think is for Clay. Is is where it needs to be right now. And I like the player option addition because you give him one or two good years. You know, who knows? Maybe somebody bites, gives him one last really big contract. Um, he can go make some good money on coming out of that, that second season of this contract. But, yeah, super, super interested to see what the Mavericks do. Obviously, um, you know, they – I think they also – uh, yeah, brought in Quentin Grimes as well, which, I again, I love the fit there. I think he can be a guy who can be a really good shooter. He had more a bit of a down year between New York and Detroit, but I think he fits in really well. And he's another guy who, obviously, playing for Tibbs, played great defense at times um, for New York. I think that we'll see that come back under a guy like Jason Kidd coaching him. So love what the Mavericks have done this offseason, trying to find ways to get better coming off of the finals. On the flip side, we already kind of already touched on it, but I do need to make it very clear. The Golden State Warriors are one of the biggest losers of free agency. Like we just said with this whole timeline stuff, you have Steph Curry and this team is that did not make the playoffs is right now today worse than they were to end last season by a lot. Like by a lot. <laughs> They're a lot worse. Um so right now, Mike Dunleavy obviously took over for Bob Myers as the GM. Uh, was this now going into his second season? Not loving it. Not loving what he's putting on film as a GM right now. No, not at all. Um, the Warriors stink. Um, yeah. They stunk last year. They got worse. They're going to stink this year. They're going to stink this year. I don't even know what to say, bro. Like... <laughs> Yeah, we, I, we can move on. It, it could be yeah, just as I, simple as that. Yeah, they were like bad, I did stink, and they got worse. Right, they're they're just gonna stink. Like I don't even know what to say. I feel for Steph. Oh man, God bless. Um, let's talk about really quickly because I think we can get it through them really quick. The Indiana Pacers, Siakam comes back on a four year deal. Obi Toppin also comes back on a four year four year deal. I was a little bit surprised to see that. I think it's. Four years, somewhere around six year, 80 million. I don't know why I can't find the official contract. The link is taking me to the wrong tweet. Uh, but they bring in two guys in their front court. Um, I'm very indifferent about their free agency so far, mainly because 
I was a guy who liked Jairus Walker a lot coming out of last year's draft. And I wish he would have gotten some play time this season, past season that just happened. And with them bringing back Obi, it feels like there's just no room for him to be able to get, you know, minutes and develop there in Indiana. Um, but again, they also don't feel like a roster that has gotten, you know, it's any type of better other than the fact that they'll have Benedict Mather and healthy, you know, come this upcoming season. Obviously wasn't there because he was hurt for their playoff run. But whether they deserve to make it or not, they were in the Eastern Conference Finals. You don't want to end up like the Atlanta Hawks. That's facts. Because uh, uh, that's honestly thinking that – I mean, they brought back their – they brought back um, Pascal. They brought back Obi. It wasn't like no real huge move that they could make in order to improve their team, I don't feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, you definitely don't want to be the team that thinks like – yeah, oh, we made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Like, we're one piece away, or we're like, you know what I mean? Like, you still have room to improve, especially when teams like the Knicks are getting better or got better. Um, the Sixers got better. Like, you still have room to improve. Another loser, I would say, so far, free agency. And there's obviously, there's going to be a theme like it is every year. The Miami Heat, because they ain't really doing nothing. Y'all are not in a position to where you, you can't be active. But Pat Riley is. He, Lately, man, what's do he be awake when free agency in the trade deadline? He just bro, be chilling. He be sleep, bro. Like <laughs> he just be sleep at the wheel. Like he, they just don't do nothing. Like especially it'd it be time, every moments where I feel like, oh yeah, this is this is the right opportunity for them, or the right move, and the right player for them. Is they just be? I don't know. It's like he don't be locked in. <laughs> He's not yeah, he watching at all. His phone be on D and D or something. Like he just don't. It's like he's like he don't be doing nothing, which is I don't know. It's weird. It's super yeah. super weird. All they've done so far is Kevin Love come came back on a restructured two year deal. He opted out and got a new contract, but that is it. I don't know what the deal is going to be with Jimmy Butler. You know, right. Pat what Riley's is happening over there. I don't know. Pat Riley's comments at the end of the season made it seem like for certain he was going to be out of there. I saw a different, uh, you know, little quote from him that now kind of made it seem like maybe Jimmy is going to stay. I don't know what's going on in Miami, but for the fact that not enough action is going on, they got to be a loser of this free agency period for sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, also, along with the the Milwaukee Bucks, they actually have – all they've done is sign DeLon Wright to a one-year deal. They have not found ways to to get better. I've seen even guys like Chris Middleton's name potentially be floated around in the trade market. They got to find a way potentially to make some upgrades because Knicks got better. Celtics are bringing all their guys back. The Sixers got better. Yesterday's price, not today's price. They got to gotta level their team up out east because the competition is getting more stiff among the top of the conference. What do you mean, bro? They got, they got Darvin Ham. You right, bro. Like what, bro? They elite. What are you talking about? You're right, bro. Bro. They, My fault. I forgot. they locked in. They up Doc Rivers with Darvin Ham. The dynamic oh duo. God. Bro, they about to be coaching circles around teams. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um another team that I have to say is also a loser and not even necessarily that there's a ton that they could have done about it. So I think their hands are a bit tied with the salary cap situation, but the Denver Nuggets not mm. gained anybody in free agency. And obviously they lost um, KCP to the Orlando magic, which was a Huge, huge signing for that team in Orlando. I think he's going to fit a plus signing. Right, so perfectly down there. It's a little um, what they need. But with the Nuggets right now, you're looking at, you know, who's going to take his spot potentially, Christian Brown or Peyton Watson. Either way, man, that, that bench was already thin. Christian Brown essentially was your bench. It's getting real, real thin, and – you just you can't ignore the depth this much or the lack of depth this much. So obviously it's still early in free agency. 
they're going to be a team that could potentially be active around the trade deadline. And then because they have Jokic, they're going to be active in the buyout market when that time does come in the season. But as of right now, I have to say they're one of the losers of free agency because they are a team that, you know, got bounced out in the second round with championship aspirations. And as of today, are in a worse spot. And I would say a good bit worse because of how much KCP did for that team defensively as a point of attack guy, but also on the offensive side of the ball as a spacer, you know, uh, catch and shoot guy, even a connector piece at times. Like he just was one of the perfect guys to pair with somebody like Jokic. And that loss is going to sting for them in Denver. 100%. They said the same thing with Bruce Brown. Like, ah, Christian Brown step up. Now you're losing KCP. It's like, oh, Christian Brown will step up. It's like, right. like, come on. Like, I mean, yeah, like I said, it's it's for a team whose bench was already thin to get even thinner and losing another key guy when you already got bounced out in the second round. It's like, it's, you're always going to be competing because you got Jokic, of course, but still, I mean, it, it's definitely not good for him this offseason. No. Uh, let's talk about the New Orleans Pelicans, um, who made – I thought – I wasn't expecting this guy to be linked to the Pelicans at all, but they go out and they trade for DeJounte Murray. Um, they And all they have to give up is Larry Nance, Dyson Daniels, and two first-round picks. And this is another, another time where I think if you would have asked – other fans of of teams what they would give up for DeJounte Murray and if they knew that that was the package I think a lot of them would be on be on board giving up that amount of value to get DeJounte Murray back obviously I think Dyson Daniels is a guy that I have a lot of stock in as a you know high high value defender and playmaker on the offensive side of the ball with you know his length but he's still young. It's going to take time for him to continue to develop develop that out. Larry Nance is a role guy, and you give up two firsts for DeJounte, who I think is underrated at this point just because the fit in Atlanta was so bad. But I still think he's a guy who, under the right circumstances, can be a very good defender, and his offensive game has grown so much over the last few years. Uh, that I think he could legitimately be – Maybe a number three, a number three option to be comfortable on a championship level team. I think he is that good of a player. Um, so this is a big, big pickup for the New Orleans Pelicans. How are you feeling about them now moving forward? Um, they got Dejounte. You still have Zion for the time being. They have Brandon Ingram, even though his name has been floated around in a lot of different trade rumors. How are you feeling about the Pelicans right now? Uh, I like it. Um, I like the trade. I like that they got a guy who can run the offense a little bit, who can actually facilitate and help. Um, did you see that stat <laughs> that was like they're like 0-20 or 0-24 when trailing in the fourth quarter this season? I know. It's crazy. Like, I didn't know if that was a real – like, that's a real stat. Like, that's insane. Um, but that comes down to execution in the fourth quarter and having someone who's going to actually like facilitate the offense a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But overall, I I like it a lot. Um, I think it's, it is what they need. I think I've seen, like he was linked to the Pelicans as far as in a trade when people were talking about trading to Zante, but a lot of the times that I've seen it, it was him for like a Brandon Ingram type of thing. Like it was like, you you know, obviously BI was still in trade talks. So, I mean, to still get him and not have to give up BI, which is, is great for them, obviously, because if they still want to move him, they still have that piece. Mm-hmm. If they want to keep him, I mean, it, it would get a little weird because you got you would have DeJounte, CJ, Zion, obviously, B.I., you still got Herb Jones, Trey Murphy. It's like, who started? Like, who's who's coming off the bench? You know what I mean? Like, that's a little bit weird, but I, that's a good problem to have yeah. rather than the other way around. It um, should be CJ. That's what I was thinking. Could, could you imagine a lineup of DeJounte, Herb, Trey, B.I., Zion running a point center? <laughs> wait, so, oh, Zion at center. Wait, hold on, You said DeJounte, DeJounte Herb, Herb, Trey, B.I. Trey. Oh, Zion at center? <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm be, all for it. It would be mad fun, probably be mad effective, like, offensively. 
Defensively, obviously, would lack a little bit because Zion, yeah. Zion is still like he's only like six. He gonna be, look, but he's a big he body gonna, though. He gonna bang. He is gonna bang, but he that you know the type of vibes it gives me. It gives me like um OKC before Chet kind of. Yeah. Obviously, a little bit different, but like they yeah. had no center type of vibe. But no, nah, I feel you though. I, I just do think it is a little bit weird because I if if it was up to me, I think that CJ should, would come off the bench in that scenario. Mm -hmm. But I like I said, I think that's a good problem to have because you still have that piece in BI if you really wanted to move him. Um, you still can play that card a little bit. So I like it. Overall, though, I, I really do like the trade for him. Like I said, I think that it's similar to when we're talking about Mikael Bridges um, to a little bit lesser extent. But as far as when you don't have that big of an offensive load, um, you might be able to step up a little bit on the defensive end, especially for a guy who used to be um, to that caliber of an elite level defender. Um, obviously, you could step up a little bit if you're not asked to take on as much of a load offensively. So I think that could be good for him, especially having guys like Herb Jones and other like good defenders around him um, that could rub off a little bit. So overall, I think it's a I think it's a really good trade. I like the fact that they didn't have to give a bi either, so they can possibly still make more more moves if they feel like it. Mm -hmm. And that is something I would be on the lookout for because I know a lot of Pelicans fans are up and down with Brandon Ingram. I have seen some that are for trading him. I've seen some that are against trading him. I don't know. The Pelicans have been super interesting. We've talked about it that it feels like at times they don't have. They don't know who the guy is, and some of that obviously has been due to injury. And you know, Zion has missed a good bit of time, but I, I would like to see them keep Bi at least for the first part of the season and see what it looks like with Dejounte. Um, and if you get you know into the season and you feel like you need to make a change, then I think that is the one that makes the most sense. Um, but I at least would like to see them give it a give it a go first. A uh, couple more teams to get through here. Uh, I would say that a, a, a slight loser, I'm not going to say they're a big loser, but a slight loser uh, is the Detroit Pistons. And it's not just because they signed Tobias Harris, which is he's back. He's back. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> he's back and somehow still got a bag. Bro, he's the uh, finesser, top Two tier finesser. Two year, fifty two million. Top tier finesser, bro. Out of Who is his agent? He's elite. Tell you that much. He is elite. He need more than ten percent, five percent. But he, I don't know. He's finessing. Um. So yeah, that move. Uh, look, obviously they have to spend their cap. So I'm. I think it's what it is more than anything. It's a. It's a body. He can supposedly he can shoot. I don't know. We didn't see it <laughs> in the playoffs. Okay. <laughs> um, but it, in theory, on paper, the fit could be could be solid. In addition to them trading uh, for Tim Hardaway Jr., any spacing you can get on the Pistons around Cade, please, please. The man is nice. playing with negative spacing <laughs> last year. Anything is better at this point. Um, and they do lock up Cade on his rookie Supermax extension, five-year, uh, I guess not Supermax, it's just a normal maximum rookie extension, five-year, $226 million. People have been questioning whether or not, you know, he's worth it, should they sign it, yada, 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 it's Cade. He's, hey, he hasn't even had a fair shake, I would say, in Detroit, and he still has performed. Considering the circumstances, well above what I would have expected from him at times. Um, so I think that if they can continue to put spacing around him, I think that's priority one, two, and three, um, for this upcoming season, just so that they can properly develop guys like Cade and Asar and Jay Nivey and let them get good reps where they're not seeing five bodies every time they go to the rim. Do you ever like realize this is kind of off topic? Do you ever realize how much money <laughs> these guys really make? Like you just Ridiculous. casually said it, like, yeah, they locked up Cade five years, two hundred million dollars. Like, and it hit me. I'm just like two hundred and twenty six million dollars, right, <laughs> bro? Like that's nuts. Even could just compare to other professional athletes, like football players, bro. That's yes, bro. <laughs> Dudes be out here like I'm talking role players that might not play in the playoffs be making more than guys like Miles Garrett. Who are winning defensive player of the year? It's bro, it's just bro, like Tatum made like 315 million dollars. 
Right. That's just his. That's no endorsements. That's just over five contract. years too. Five a five year span. And his like, next contract is gonna be like a five year, like, bro, four hundred and thirty. Man, oh my, Wimby about in like. Wemby is gonna get Wimby the first prime. five year seven hundred and twenty five million dollar like that's just, crazy. That's just gonna be like five year a billion dollars. <laughs> five years one point two billion dollars. Like, yeah. Shout out to y'all, man. I wish I was six six. Hey, <laughs> six look, six, you could jump out the gym. Wemby is gonna get himself a crazy contract because he got himself a point guard that'll give him the ball now. Thank it's you, God. Cr- Thank you, God. We don't have to watch Sohan anymore. <laughs> oh my God, bro! He was literally sabotaging Wimby, bro. I like, i bro. I did not hear what I say, bro. He was legit sabotaging, bro. Like, I don't care. Like, he finally has an actual point guard. It is absolutely perfect. A guy like CB3 can come in, help develop him a little bit. Obviously, mm-hmm. set him up. It's just as far as like actual play on the court. But man, I I think I think it's perfect, especially for a guy like Chris Paul. Because obviously, if you're going to the Spurs, you're packing it in as far as yeah. like trying to win something. You're they. I think they even said it like he had a talk with like uh, Popovich and like Spurs stuff like that. He was sold on the culture and the overall like kind of develop helping Wimby develop, um, which could be big. He could have a big that could help his legacy in a way just as far as like a guy who was like crucial to especially if Wimby becomes like what we all think he can become like that could be a crucial um like st- like part of his career kind of thing for Wimby um it for people looking back he's well. done it either exactly um, yeah did that with okay see right um so yeah I I think it's absolutely perfect for perfect. I love that I loved it for him yeah I think it's crazy because it was I don't, I don't want to say joked about a bit that Chris Paul would come to San Antonio and play with Wemby, but I never thought it would really happen. Like I didn't think I thought, he would accept it. Right. I thought he would be a guy that would ring chase essentially these last couple of years mm-hmm. of his career. Um, so for him to, like you said, really, I think, pack it in on the fact that he's going to win a championship. Because uh, I, I think this is, this is probably his last contract. I think he's probably going to retire after this season. Um, for him to get to play with Wimby and potentially turn him into a monster, you know what? That's a fine way to play your last NBA season, Chris Paul. And I'm gonna have a good time, so I'm gonna go to a lot of them Spurs games. Hey, when you when you touch down in San Antonio, you gotta check in with me, bro. Mm-hmm. I got you. You gotta check got in you. with me. Yeah, Chris Paul. He said, "Listen, bro. Golden State beat me all them years. I joined them, and they start losing. Yeah, it's over. I got right. He just, I, he just got I, bad luck, bro. It just like yeah, it's just it's me. It's me. But now, realistically though, this is Celtic Shack. Like this is the yeah. the Warriors jersey was already Celtic Shack. Crazy. Yeah. This one is like Phoenix Shack. <laughs> like this is like he, man. Like he's he's gonna have you know that Shack picture." Where it's like, oh, he's gonna, have jersey, it, yep. he's gonna have one of those, which is crazy because, like, Chris Paul is actually like my favorite point guard of all time, so it's a little sad to see. But hey, man, hey, I don't, who knows? Maybe when BT up, and I don't know, maybe they build pieces around him sooner rather than later. And Chris Paul decides another one year, dear. I don't know, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Real, most realistically, he's just gonna help when be develop, and he can look back and it's like, oh, Chris Paul really helped me. When I won ten championships in twenty DPOYs, yeah, it 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 feels like that's what's gonna happen. Chris Paul, if it's one thing Chris Paul is gonna do, he's gonna get his center some easy looks. Man, listen, he made DeAndre Ayton I mean, look like he was way better than what he actually is. I can't, bro. They drafted a center, bro. <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, well, that's, that's a whole different tangent for another time, bro. Uh, let's get through these last couple teams that we haven't touched on. Um, Cavs haven't made any moves. I read a report today uh, that it seems like Donovan Mitchell is going to be trending towards a super max extension there in Cleveland. Uh, and then immediately saw somebody say that he's turning into the new generation Damian Lillard. Um, thoughts? <laughs> Uh, nah, I don't, I wouldn't say that. I don't think Damian Lillard was more so like 
he kept talking about how like uh he like no i, I wouldn't say that i don't, I don't think there's no he, damian lillard wasn't a a I can't re- compare nobody to Damian Lillard. Right, because he I, did it with the team that draft. Like, he was loyal to that. If, right. they, if Donovan Mitchell was still in Utah with this Utah team, being like, yeah, I'm going to come back and get my bag here, then, I, yeah, I, I would be right there with the Damian Lillard. Right. Like, and, and talking like, oh, we can win in Utah. They can build a team in Utah. Players are going to come play with me in Utah. Like, right. if nothing compares to Damian Lillard. Because it, it got to the point where, like, we're like, bro, go, go ring chase. Like, please. Go leave. Like, please leave. Like, yeah. so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that one. Um, The Rockets, they get in A.J. Griffin as part of a, a trade with the Hawks. Um, and then they also bring in Aaron Holiday. They also did make a trade to acquire some draft picks, which was speculated to potentially be to try to lure, and I guess it's still possible, lure Kevin Durant from Phoenix to Houston, potentially even willing to trade Shangun to do so. Thank you. I was about to ask you how you feel about it. You don't like it. I don't like it. Why would you trade Alpi? I don't like it. I don't. I don't even want KD on this team. I don't think that makes timelines sense. don't match up at all. You're not even ready for that. Like for what to be a first round exit? Like it just don't even. You're not that. You're not that piece away, bro. It just no. I don't like it at all. <laughs> I really believe somebody's out there. Like, well, I, I know it happens. Somebody's blowing smoke. Somebody's talking to a reporter and being like, mm, "What if you should tweet this out?" You know what I mean? Like trying right. to start a pot. There's no way that they would actually do that. If they did, I would be stunned. Um, it, don't even, it don't even make sense. I don't, you know, it just don't make sense. You're not that piece yeah. away. You're not. No, I'm good. Um, we didn't, we didn't talk about the moves that the Clippers have made outside of uh, obviously losing Paul George and getting Derrick Jones Jr. They do also sign Mo Bamba, Nicholas Batum, Chris Dunn. James Harden comes back to the Clippers on, I think it was a two-year, $70 million deal. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they also get Kevin Porter Jr., who spent the last year in Greece after he had (sighs) off-the-court issues. I don't know how he's even back in the league. I don't understand. Yeah, that was crazy. I'm not going to talk about that part. That's crazy. But (sighs) Clippers, 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 man. Yeah, he was talking about running L.A., you know, Kawhi Paul George. Y'all oh, this is, this is your moment, bro. Talk on their grave, bro. Y'all about to be a dynasty. Y'all saw billboards. Kawhi run this town. This is Clippers town. Best team in L.A. We not the little brothers no more. Y'all got nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing to show for it. Y'all got hurt every single year when it was your year. Matter of fact, I lied. The only thing you got to show for it is, you beat the Lakers 11 straight games or whatever it was. Congratulations, bro. Congratulations. Your best chance you blew a 3-1 lead when y'all was both healthy. Got Paul George hitting the side of the backboard. Kawhi folding. Kawhi's knees is made of freaking Twizzlers. Like, I don't know. Like, he can't stay healthy. It's just, it's, I just love it, man. I love it. I love seeing my ops downfall. I really do. Is amazing. I feel like Draymond Green when he was smiling on TNT hating on Rudy Gobert. That's what I that's what I feel like right now. So it's just, it's just great, man. It's great. Well, the Lakers got a championship out of the LeBron, you know, AD era. Paul's leaving. Kawhi's not never healthy. You guys about to move into a new arena, and James Harden's going to be the leading act. Oh, it's just, oh my god, this <laughs> script by this was so crazy. Yes, yeah, it was funny. You know, it's funny. This would probably be the year Kawhi is fully healthy for the playoffs. Bro, I swear. Kawhi <laughs> play every playoff game this year. Nah, bro. That's he, terrible. He's going to be 100% fully healthy for the playoffs, bro. Oh, it's so funny. I, oh, my God. The Clippers are hella. It's some players, you're just, you're just destined for poverty, bro. And hey. this is how it is. Most toilets in the NBA now in their new arena. No other arena got more toilets than good, into a they're, dome. They're shit. So good. <laughs> good. They need it. I, saw, I think I was listening to Pick a Side, and they were like, it's good because more, more people are going to be wanting to go and use the bathroom to actually watch it Clippers basketball next year. Oh, I love the – I just – like – it's just because they talk so much. Like it was so many like, 
we're gonna run LA. It's so like oh the Lakers era, like LeBron, what y'all do, blah blah blah. And people hating on AD talking about saying he's always hurt, he's always hurt. Kawhi and Paul George is always like why are they not don't get the same. Well, now they do, but before yeah. they get in the same sort of slack. Like, what are we talking about? I just think it just wasn't matching up. The noise was too high for the little they actually accomplished. They did nothing. That I saw somebody, somebody was like end of an error. He said, No, end of an error. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh, this is it's amazing. I love it. I absolutely no, it's it's crazy to look back on this whole timeline of how we got here and Paul George leaving OKC at three in the morning to, to go to LA. They said that they got Kawhi, but Kawhi would only come if they could get PG. Lost in the shuffle of all of this, they done built the thunder. They did build Shea, the thunder. Shea was the piece that was moved to OKC in that trade. Sam Presti, here he go again. Another fleece. <laughs> like, bro. bro. It's, it's like, it's crazy because, like, I don't even, like, after a while I started falling Clippers fans and people talking about the Clippers, like, when they stopped being healthy. Initially, when I first seen it, like, I literally remember the notification. It was Kawhi signed to the Clippers for blah, 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 blah. Right after Paul George straight, da, 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 da. I'm like, oh, like this, they look could be legit. Like, that's a real good team, mm -hmm. but they just never could come to fruition. Nope. They never actually get it done. So, it's what it is, man. Lake Show, baby. Best team in LA. That is how you got any finals words for the, the Kawhi PG era? Just let it all out here. I'd already done, probably got. Three different shorts. I'm about to clip <laughs> over what you just said. You got a, You got one more in you? Fuck the Clippers, man. <laughs> Fuck the Clippers. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I'm good, man. They they done, they done did it to themselves. I'm good. <laughs> to rattle through the last <laughs> bit of teams here, because I do want to close off talking about your Lakers. Um, Grizzlies didn't make any moves, but obviously their biggest thing was just health. They also did go out and draft Zach Eady. So they, they got themselves a big to potentially play next to Jaron so he doesn't have to play the five. I think – I was stunned that they didn't find a way to trade up and draft Klingon out of UConn. I think that fit was, like, too perfect. But, hey, if Edie can translate a little bit, bro, you can't teach size. And he is about 7'3", 7'4". Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the Heat. We talked about the Bucks. Timberwolves haven't done much from a free agency perspective, but they did trade – I think it's a 2031. Yeah, something crazy. Yeah, like something that. like that. First round pick to <laughs> the San Antonio Spurs during the draft to get Rob Dillingham, who a lot of people consider to be the best scorer in this draft. People project predicting that he might be the long term replacement for Mike Conley at point guard. Um, <clears throat> and he can form a very dynamic backcourt pairing with Anthony Edwards, two guys who can really just give you buckets from anywhere on the court. Um, the only guy play. I really know in the draft <laughs> it right. was Rob he's, Dillingham. <laughs> he's a bucket getter. Um, mm -hmm. I think that is something that could potentially be a, a steal that we look at a few years from the line and say, man, that's a crazy addition that they were able to find um, because he's going to be a guy that they don't have to pay for a couple of years, obviously being a draft pick versus having to go out and shell out a bunch of cash now to try to get a high value free agent. They already have a bunch of money tied up between Rudy and Cat and Anthony Edwards. Um, so it makes, makes a ton of sense right now for them. And I think he can potentially contribute this upcoming season in mm -hmm. a bench role and get gradually worked up in phase of to potentially being a starter if everything progresses uh, that way. So do love that move for Minnesota. Um, we didn't talk a ton about the magic outside of the KCP trade, which or not trade, but the signing, but uh, that's the biggest move. They also, uh, got, uh, Goga Batazzi back and Gary Harris, um, also is back playing for the Orlando magic, but that KCP fit is just, is perfect. I don't think the magic are done. I think they're going to try to find a way to potentially make one more splash type move, but even if they don't, just adding KCP to this core that's going to get better. I Huge. think this is the year they take that next step and can maybe potentially get, you know, into the second round or, you know, push somebody deep 
um, you know, heading into the, the conference semis. So love that for Orlando. Phoenix Suns, your boy, Bull Bull, coming back on a one-year deal. <laughs> I'm so dead. Hey, man, the way they situation set up, he's got to be a key rotational player for them. <laughs> he might be, bro. He might be. Hey, let the let the TikTok and Instagram comments tell. He might be their best player. They just not giving him opportunity. Bro. He don't. <laughs> He just don't got a chance, bro. Like, bro, coaches hate him, bro. Like, the league is blackballing him, bro. Just give him an opportunity. <laughs> He'll drop 30. Like, what are we doing? Oh. I, <laughs> the discourse around him. I've never seen a player babied so much by, like, social media ever in my life. It's so ridiculous. Wow. Oh, um, the Kings... Alex Len comes back. They trade for Jalen McDaniels and big, big move. They were able to retain Malik Monk on a four-year deal, which was massive. I thought he was certainly going to be out the door. I think he actually took a slight pay cut to stay with Sacramento, which was big. I didn't think um, he was going to be able to pay him. I didn't think so either, but huge for them. Obviously, he's been so big uh, for this team the last couple of years. Uh, I want to make sure I get his deal right. He signed a four-year, $78 million deal. Um, with Sacramento. Uh, this was a guy that took a chance on himself and signed a minimum not too long ago to play for the Los Angeles Lakers. He was amazing, too. So he deserves all the money he gets. He was the one right. that season was so bad. I, I say this all the time. He was the only bright spot in that whole season, bro. I love Malik Monk. So he deserves every every single dollar that he gets. Yeah, took the prove it deal, proved it, went, got paid, and then now went and really cashed in, got the big payday. So shout out to Malik Monk. Um, the Raptors, they get Scotty Barnes, his max extension, um, which is five years up to $270 million. So they lock in Scotty. They lock in Emmanuel quickly. They trade for Davion Mitchell. They bring Garrett Temple back. And then Sasha Vizenkov also comes in a trade with the Kings. Um, standard stuff, even though quietly I do really like the Davion Mitchell trade. Uh, you know, I think he fits the type of mold of player that Masai Jerry likes and that they've kind of utilized there in Toronto, obviously not necessarily with the size, but from a defensive perspective, his scrappiness, um, I think he'll slot in well as a bench contributor there. But nothing too, too crazy on the Raptor side of things. So, so Scotty Barnes gets 270 because he made an all-star team? I believe so, yeah. Okay. I'm always, I'm trying to learn more about, like, uh, the way contracts and yeah. the incentives and stuff. like. Cause I want to learn more about, like, Especially with like the uh, um, second apron and all that type of stuff. I want to learn more about that type of stuff because it was definitely pretty interesting. Yeah, I think if you make an all star team and or an all NBA team, there's different tiering. Right. Um, I, kn I knew it was all NBA multiple. for sure. Because yeah. I know they were always, they always said, like, oh, he just me missed, or no, he was like, now he's eligible for this because he made an all NBA. I always right. heard that before. Um, last couple here, the Jazz bring in Drew Eubanks and cut Omer Yurt seven. Nothing crazy there. They're obviously in a lot of trade talks, uh, potentially to be moving Lori Markinen, um, which could be the next big domino that that falls this offseason. Now the Warriors are trying to be in that sweepstakes now because yeah. they missed out on Paul George. Or why, like, why not? They gotta get better somehow. Might as well. That's why I Probably gonna see it. Lakers interested in Lori marketing just to never not even come close to getting them. Right. <laughs> um, the Wizards they go out and they obviously have the number two overall draft pick. They get Alex Sar, who a lot of people thought might have been the best player um in this draft class. Um, in addition to bringing in Malcolm Brogdon and Jonas Valanciunas. But also trading away, arguably, their best player, Kenny <laughs> Avadia, to the Portland Trailblazers, which I love that for Portland. I think he fits so well alongside Scoot and Anthony Simons and Shane Sharp. I think he's going to be able to bring so much on the defensive side of the ball and then as a connector on the offensive side, um, his ability to play and transition, to be a uh, catch-and-shoot guy, but also a guy that can put on the deck and create for himself and others. Uh, I just think he is a guy who could have 
really plugged and played with any team and especially any contending team would have loved to have, I think, a guy like Denny. Kind of sucks a little bit that he's going to go to Portland where they're not going to be really competing for anything anytime soon. But I do still think the fit with the young core is great. So definitely shout out to Portland, who, again, we mentioned earlier, also drafted Klingon, uh, Donovan Klingon, that is, out of UConn. Um, so making some big strides defensively when you have guys like Shane Sharp and Anthony who can carry a load, I think, offensively with the, the scoring punch that they provide. That is 29 of the 30 teams. I saved the Lakers for last because a lot has happened since you last got to talk about the Los Angeles Lakers. So I'm first going to turn it over to you to ask you this. How are you feeling that J.J. Reddick is your head coach? I forgot we never talked about that. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little wow. minute. It has been a minute. Um, I'm not gonna lie. The Lakers fan in me is starting to drink the Kool Aid after I've seen the press conferences. This is nothing basketball related. This is nothing, nothing. This is delusion talking. This is just like he's our coach now. Let's just get I, hyped. I'm gonna say something. JJ Reddick as a coach, he he got a little aura. That's what I'm saying. That's what it, it's getting me, bro. I'm not gonna lie, it's getting me. It's nothing basketball related. It's nothing like legit. X is it no, it's literally just aura. It's just vibes. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm feeling the vibes. That's all I'm going to say. But just as far as, uh, <clears throat> just as far as him, him actually being our head coach, I think that it's a little bit annoying how we butcher um, our head coaches all the time as far as lowballing guys and then acting surprised when we don't get them. It's very, very annoying to go through that whole process because if I knew if we were offering, um, Hurley 70 mil, 70 mil instead of the so reported eight years of 100 mil. I wouldn't even got hype. He wasn't leaving for that. I, it wasn't going to have to be some outstanding offer. But, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how they handle it. Um, So it is what it is, I guess. But realistically, with JJ Reddick, we talked about it before. I mean, it's going to be a little bit tough Um, because, like I said, it's a first time guy who hasn't coached any sort of basketball outside of like an AAU team, his kids' AAU team. Um, so then we're not questioning, obviously, his basketball mind, his basketball intelligence, things like that, but just as far as being a first-time head coach in a situation to where you have pressure on you to at least make it far in the playoffs, mm -hmm. even then, guys, bro, it's championship coaches that get fired. Um, now, obviously, I think if J.J. wins a championship, I think he's cemented. Like, I think he'll be upset because um, like he, that would be – insane for him to do that especially as a first year guy or even as like a year two guy um but just like i said the pressure that you have coaching the la lakers and especially the lebron led la lakers is just it's i don't really want to see it for a first time guy who's never coached before but like I said, there's a world where who knows maybe he gets the offense running a little bit smoother he gets the execution going well um we look more like a, a well-coached team and it, it could be a world where it works out, even if we don't win the championship. Um, but hopefully, if anything, if he shows promise, they give him like a longer of a leash. Don't just like kind of like wash him to the side because like I said I think he knows basketball for sure. So this, I think he, there's a world where he can be a good NBA coach. I just it's a little bit tough in this certain situation. Definitely. The next question I have for you is how do you feel about drafting Dalton Connect and adding some floor spacing to this roster? I'm not a big college basketball guy. Not even wasn't familiar with his game. Apparently he can shoot. Apparently he can space the floor. Everyone, literally everyone I've seen is saying it's a great pick. Literally everyone I've seen is saying it's a good fit. So I'm with it. I'm cool. And the name Connect Four is hard. That's a hard Connect nickname. Connect Four is an elite nickname. That's a hard nickname. So again, Aura Vibes, we here. We do it. We listen. That's two for two. Aura and Vibes. That's two for two. The last question I have for you is the biggest talking point around probably the biggest second round storyline in NBA draft history. LeBron is on the same team as his son. 
Bronny James is a Los Angeles Laker. How are you feeling about that? So I'm going to speak on the LeBron playing with his son part of it first. That's insane. That is historic. That's iconic. That is legendary. That is insane. Mm -hmm. Like, unless you hate LeBron, that is the only people who should be upset as far as or just hating in some sort of way as far as like LeBron having the longevity to play with his son on the same basketball team. Like you, those pictures of him hold like him in the NBA holding his like toddler son. Those guys are the teammates. Like it's it's insane. So that is like insane. The fact that he was able to actually like um, pull that out. Um, that's going to be really good. Really, really cool. Obviously it makes history as the first like father son, like kind of duo or teammates in the NBA, um, which is super, super amazing. So that's great from that standpoint of it. The people, I just want to address the people who are mad that, I mean, obviously LeBron helped his son get to the Lakers, get to the league, get picked, this and the third. We used a 50 overall pick on him. I just want to say, one, a lot of those people can't name 10 people in this draft in general. Facts. So it's like using, oh, yeah, I really used a pick on him. Somebody else could have got blah, blah, blah. Bro, you couldn't even name 10 people in the first round of this draft. Anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like, what are you even talking about from that standpoint? Two, name me the last five 55th overall picks. N name me uh, any other 55th overall pick. <laughs> like, what are we talking about, bro? Like, if we use 17, I'm not going to lie, I'd have been pissed. I'd have been a little pissed. Been, been nice. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you're bugging, bro. <laughs> you're bugging. Like, obviously, you see what happened. That's been a guy we could actually use. Right. 55th overall, second round. Would have been a bum anyway. Might as well be LeBron James's bum. Like, might as well, <laughs> <Right>? be, <laughs> might as well be LeBron James Jr., bro. Mm -hmm. So, like, what's, I don't see the reason as to hate that. Because, like I said, already with the legendary stuff, it's cool. It's a cool story. Like, that's really dope. And, I, and like, he's not, like, obviously, I was joking as far as him being a bum. I do think he's not NBA ready for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, I mean, he's LeBron James' son. He's athletic. He can shoot a little bit. Like, he, you, there's a world where he can develop in, in a couple years, maybe be, like, at least a rotational type of guy. Um, So, yeah, it's like I don't really see the problem. Like, it, I don't see the problem, bro. It's, what was it, three picks from being undrafted? Like, who yeah. who cares? Who cares? Like it'd be different if like he drafted like some like five six guy who don't play. It's almost like some dude that don't play ball at all. Shouldn't even don't even play college. Like all right, I'm like, all right, bro, you're kind of bugging. But right. even then, still, I wouldn't really personally. I wouldn't really care. So you got the Nassis in the league. This guy stinks. We got freaking coaches, sons. We got oh, matter of fact. Place. Genie Bus is got it passed down, so it's like that. That's how it, that's not even just the NBA, that's how it works all over the place. Family businesses, right. um, people get you know, you get it. Yeah, aunt work for this company, they get you an interview. Your friend work at this place, they get you a you know, to end with a recruit or whatever the case may be. People leverage their connections and they leverage their family. That's just a reality of the world, bro. Literally, like that's just what happens, bro. You live off of connections make that the connections are a big part of like life in general so right. i don't see the the reason to hate behind it like i said if it was 17 i'd get it but it's like bro it's the 55th overall pick bro i don't i i wouldn't even have known who we drafted at 55th if it, was, if it wasn't bron i right. promise you i would not know his name so if, to me i don't really care i think it's cool and i have no problem with it I will say the only negatives I have in this whole situation is really about how it played out. And it's only from the perspective that as if you're Bronny, you are not in a position to be declining workouts. I think I said this on one of the previous episodes. That's like, true. You're not, you shouldn't be in a position to decline workouts. You, you really shouldn't be in a position where you got rich Paul calling other teams talking about some, don't draft him or he going to go play in Australia or whatever, like to force his way to LA at the same time though. Like I almost going to play devil's advocate with myself. There have been multiple stories of players and agents doing that type of thing. Tyrese Halliburton did it. 
to not avoid getting drafted by the Pistons. Austin Reeves did it to not get drafted at all so that he could go and right. sign with the Lakers because he knew he wanted to go play with the Lakers and other teams were thinking about potentially picking him. He was like, I'm, please don't. I don't want to come here. So it's not unforeseen. It's just the fact that I, I do think he's a guy that can net out being a really high value role player in the NBA from everything that I've watched and everyone else that I've heard that I value their opinion on scouting and player analysis. He gives off like Marcus smart type vibes as like the ceiling, like what he could really potentially develop into, which is like, again, a guy that can do a little bit of everything. And is DPOI. right. Athlete, yeah. great defense, good in transition. Um, if he's able to develop a shot from, you know, long range, that's, you know, even an added benefit there. So it's like the upside makes sense. The story makes more sense than anything. Like, bro, in the sport of basketball, a guy is going to be playing with his son. And it, I think it was it was either Woj or Brian Winhorse said it best. It's like, bro, you need to think about the fact that it's like, okay, yes, he's going to be on the same team as his son. He's also still, at worst, like a top 15 to 20 player right now, about to be age 40, playing with the Sun. It's not like he's washed and just sticking around to play with his right. son. Mm-hmm. He's still at the, you know, near the top of the league and has been there for so long that his son is literally now also in that league. And he's still playing up to the top, uh, you know, the cream of the crop in the NBA. So, Outside of that little bit of how it was handled and him kind of like denying workouts and the calls of forces way there, I'm personally just not a huge fan of, and that would kind of go for everybody. But again, I understand it, and it's not like he's the only one that do it does it. So I'm not going to sit here and bash him for it. The only thing I want to say about that, outside of that story itself, is like we already says, unbelievable. The them, I think we texted about this them. The first time that they throw a lob, either way, whether it's LeBron to Bronny or Bronny to LeBron, probably going to be like a preseason game or something. Mm -hmm. That picture is going triple platinum, bro. That's going to be one of the hardest photos of all time. LeBron either throwing or catching a lob in a Lakers uniform from his son. Crazy. That is nuts. nuts. It's gonna. They need to recreate the uh, D Wade picture. They do. That'd be that'd be hard. That'd be hard. Is it? Like I said, yeah. It's it's insane, man. It's insane. No, like I think um the only thing that I'd say is like I do think that maybe just as far as for Bronny himself, he might have been able to benefit long term if he actually went back to college and like try to develop a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um. So that I think that's the only thing I'd say because I do think if he uh, if he wasn't LeBron's son, he I don't think he even would have declared for the draft. I think he probably would have just went back to school. Um, but yeah, as far as like he's he's here, he declared for the draft. Like I have no problem with it. I I can't wait for that moment where they are on the court at the same time, like whether it be preseason, garbage time, and a game, like whatever it may be, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be absolutely fantastic. Right. It's it's just adding another ridiculous accolade accomplishment storyline to what is one of the most decorated careers of, of any athlete in not just the NBA, but really any sport at this point, like LeBron's resume is absurd and can stack up to anybody else. Obviously, if you're not just looking at just the rings, <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I'm super excited to see that fully play out preseason, like you said, garbage time, whatever the case may be. You know, and with JJ as a coach, he gonna he's gonna find a time to make it happen. Hundred mm-hmm, um, percent. He did also say he's unfortunately not doing the podcast and coaching. I was hoping mm-hmm. there was a sliver of hope that maybe we could have got you know just like a little something. The the basketball like just the non Lakers fan that love the pod yeah for sure the Lakers fan in me I don't want to see my coach doing a podcast bro NBA media that actually NBA media might be the biggest loser of the off season so far for real they, we we lost a, a, a top tier elite talent and we yeah. get guys like 
Kendrick Perkins getting bumped up now. Like, oh no, we down bad. Down bro. horrendous. <laughs> down horrendous. Mm-hmm. But I, 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 like I said, I don't want to see my coach doing podcasts with a player attacked. Yeah, that would be crazy, especially it after be the wild. loss. So yeah, yeah. So we lost to we lost to the Celtics today because they were running, and then they just go through our plays. Like, what what are they supposed to do? <laughs> Exposing themselves, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's gonna. This season is gonna be wild. Seeing JJ Reddit, co- like, imagine going back five, six years, and somebody comes up to you and is like, "Bro, did you see that JJ Reddit is coaching LeBron?" You'd be like, "Wait, what? That don't even see- what? Like, don't that does sense. not make sense at all." He came into the league after LeBron, right? JJ Reddit is coaching LeBron and his son, and his son. Nah, this. That's I would be like, huh, huh, huh. Run like, that bike again. Right. Like, what are you talking about, bro? No, nah, it's crazy. It's wild. The story, uh, the script writers, they're uh they're cooking. They're, I see yeah. the long-term story ch- telling they're trying to set up here. They're going stupid right now. They yeah. really are. I respect it. I uh, no, I'm I'm 100 percent all for it. Uh I do gotta ask you, uh, you 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 forward DeMar as a Laker or no? Nah. I don't know. I don't like the fit. I didn't like the fit in the be- in the beginning, not the beginning, but uh, initially when he was rumored to go there like years ago. Yeah. I don't know. I just Demar mid range guy can't space the floor. It's more. It's it, it's it's. I don't think it's as bad as the Russell Westbrook one, but Definitely it gives that not. same type of vibe of just like let's just get us another talented good player, guy yeah. in there. Yeah, like let's not even worry about fit. Let's just get another good player in there. So I don't really like it that much. Uh yeah, I I think it would be interesting to see them play together, but I don't think it makes the most sense from a spacing or bat like really just basketball perspective. Yeah, like trying to win games. Right. I don't I don't want to do that, bro. I don't want another. I don't want a mid range guy who's not elite defender who can't really shoot. Who don't shoot the three ball. Like, and it's nothing against Demar. Like he's obviously he's a great player, but I I'm I'm straight, bro. I'm good. I don't want that. Fair, fair, understandable. Um, bro, have you seen this video of sketch freestyling on that dude's live stream? Yes, I have. He went stupid. <laughs> I didn't know. Did you know that there was more than one clip? Like he did it for I think the whole live stream was a couple hours. But I see him on a whole different beat going crazy. I'm gonna have to send it to you. It bro, Please he was do. he was rapping for like two and a half minutes straight until the dude like Got too hype and cut them off. <laughs> like, <laughs> now nah, I gotta see it. Please send that to me. I gotta see it. I got you. If y'all haven't seen it, bro, this man's sketch was was flowing. He was going uh, the the little clip I seen. He was going stupid. He was going when he said some some about Darren McFadden. I'm like, nah, that was a ball. Yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He that was, was a he went stupid bar. Darren McFadden. Stupid. I ain't even. It was a bar and it's a sports name I ain't heard in so long. Like it was that crazy pull. Hit both parts of my brain. So perfect. <laughs> I was like, nah, that was elite. <laughs> that was elite. Um, you got anything anything else you want to talk about before we get up out of here? Um, I don't think so, man. I'm excited. I want the Olympics to start soon. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's gonna be elite hoops. I see seen Luca, very- Luca out there. Little circus shot. Learn learning from Kyrie for real, yeah. but I think that's gonna be fun. That's that, gonna that, hold us that, over. That leg leg ain't look too bad. I'm not no, so to like, be to be to be fair. I don't think because I seen people was like, Yeah, what happened to all them them six broken ribs <laughs> and the torn ACL he had? You're right. I'm like, I don't think they was gassing his injury that much in the finals. <laughs> like, I think and even Luca himself, I think he he didn't make no excuses really. Yeah, no, he, he didn't. I think people were just not used to seeing Luca not be like like they was playing good defense, so like when that happens, they're like, ah, he must really be hurt. But like, right? <laughs> it wasn't like a he's out there, he can't play at all. He's just thugging it out. Like, nah, he was good enough to play. Yeah, he or he wouldn't be in the Olympics right now. Exactly. Yeah, but Olympics coming up, summer league coming up in a couple weeks. Before you know it, it's gonna be preseason football. I can't. Oh, I can't wait for football, man. I need it. I need it. I need it. 
Oh, I need it, man. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to get back into the football. It's been too. Oh, long. for sure. Oh, we gonna it's tap in for sure. We'll, listen, we're gonna, we'll tap it off the gridiron a little bit. Off, off the, the gridiron. gridiron. It's coming. It's coming. Y'all maybe be, stay tuned. Maybe you can make the banner a different color for football. Who knows? Like maybe the, we make uh, a whole or, separate podcast, whole separate channel. Maybe you never. Maybe you never know. You gotta make sure the algorithm treats us right. We can't. We can't that is true. Yeah, we can't mix and match too much. <laughs> that is true. That is true. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll figure it out. But Definitely. I'm with it. I'm excited. Uh, but with that, that's gonna do it for episode 62 of the Off the Glass Podcast. As always, if you made it this far, we appreciate you. Leave us a like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to audio platforms. You know the deal. Five star. Five star. Five star. Follow us on the social platforms. You see there at the bottom of the screen. As always, I'm Billy. That's Dame. And we out. Peace.